By now, I hope you have a better understanding of both common intention constructive trust and resulting trust. In this video, we are going to focus on the interaction between these two trusts. The important cases are Stan and Dalton and Jones and Kernan. There is also the recent Hong Kong case of prime credit. So let's start. The problem we have here is how we can ascertain the party's shares in the property. We always start with the legal position. For the position in equity, the presumption of equity follows the law applies. So let's look into the sole ownership context. Let's say we have A, who is the sole legal owner of a property. For the position in equity, the presumption of equity follows the law applies. So A is also the sole beneficial owner. But then comes B, who claims beneficial interest. So B has to rebut the presumption of equity follows the law. There are two approaches. We have to bear in mind that whenever we face a legal problem in relation to trust, we have to justify why we prefer one approach over the other. For example, the common intention constructive trust approach has been endorsed by the Hong Kong court in the case of prime credit. So this is how the approach goes. There are two hurdles that B has to overcome. For the first hurdle, B has to show that both parties intend him to have some beneficial interest in the property. So B has to show express or inferred common intention, as well as detrimental reliance by him. Detrimental reliance can be financial contribution to the property. For the second hurdle, B has to ascertain the quantity of the beneficial interest. So we have to look at the party's whole course of conduct to infer or impute common intention in relation to the quantity of each of the shares. So this is the common intention constructive trust approach. Moving on to the resulting trust approach. There are two questions that we have to ask. For the first question, we have to ask what is the party's common intention at the time of acquisition. So we look at the party's contribution towards the purchase price. We have to see whether the presumption of resulting trust may arise. And for the case of Hong Kong, whether the presumption of advancement may also arise. And for the second question, we have to ask whether the party's common intention has changed after acquisition. So we have to see if there is any compelling evidence that suggests a change in common intention. We have to look at the party's whole course of conduct. And this is when the common intention constructive trust approach may sit into the analysis. So this is how the two trusts apply in the sole ownership context. Moving on to the co-ownership context. This time, we have a property that is conveyed in the joint names of A and B. So A and B can be legal joint tenants or tenants in common. Let's say A has 80% and B has 20% of the interest. For the position in equity, the presumption of equity follows the law applies. So A and B may be beneficial joint tenants or tenants in common with the same amount of shares. Let's say B claims otherwise. So again, B has to rebut the presumption of equity follows the law. There are two approaches. The first approach is to establish a common intention constructive trust. This time, B does not have to overcome the first hurdle. It has been automatically overcome because the property has been conveyed in joint names. But B has to overcome the second hurdle, which concerns qualification of the beneficial interest. So we have to look at the party's whole course of conduct to infer or impute their common intention with respect to the quantity of each of their shares. Then for the second approach, that is the resulting trust approach. It is basically the same as how it is applied in the sole ownership context. So there are two questions. The first question is what is the party's intention at the time of acquisition? So this is when the presumption of resulting trust, and for the case of Hong Kong, as well as the presumption of advancement, may arise. And then for the second question, we ask whether the party's common intention has changed after acquisition. So again, we have to look at any compelling evidence which may suggest a change in their common intention. We have to look at their whole course of conduct. So this is all we have to know about common intention constructive trust and resulting trust. Thanks for watching.